Okay, we're uh, let's let's take let's kick off the show. Uh, my name is BJ Morgan with the Museum of Making Music. It's our Thursday, our first Thursday ever uh, Mom at Home series, and today. Uh, Mr. Bill has invited a special guest along. I'm going to let you take it away, and I'm going to duck out of the conversation. I'll still be here. I'll be uh, watching the, the chat from our YouTube channel and uh, passing on any questions. But, uh, gentlemen, take it away, and uh, let's start the show. Let's do it. Thank you so much, BJ. A little, uh, Ryan, if it's okay, a little introduction here. Uh, so we can uh, bring you to the world. Uh, Ryan and I met in college uh, some years ago, shall we say, and uh, we were both very fortunate to sing in an organization called the University Choir, which uh, was at California State Long Beach and was under the baton of Frank Pooler. Uh, anybody who's involved in choral music really has been touched by Mr. Pooler in one way or another, be it uh, directly in his choir or singing under a choir whose director was in his choir, uh, singing choral arrangements that are in the Frank Pooler Library, right? Uh, quite a wide reach uh, Mr. Pooler had. And, and Ryan and I were both uh, so blessed. Uh, the other day, Dave uh, Liggett, long staff member, and I were talking about the schedule, putting it together. And he said, you know, I've always wondered what goes on when I see a conductor up there doing what they do. Uh, how about a session so that we can educate people on that? And I thought, you know, you're right. People see a conductor, their hands are moving, the baton is moving, but what exactly are they doing? So Ryan, uh, bingo, you came to mind and I thought, let's bring you in. You are an educator, you're a singer, you're a trumpet player. I hope you play a little trumpet for us today too. And uh, for today's purposes, a conductor. So let's start out, Ryan, in a nutshell. What are you doing when you're up there conducting? Well, I think, you know, the role of the conductor is a, you're a communicator, right? You want to be able to communicate what it is that you want to come off of that page along because you're trying, you're trying to replicate what it is the composer has put together for you. So you're looking at those, all those little, you know, the chicken scratch and saying, how do I make this come to life? And how can I communicate with my ensemble, whether vocal or instrumental, so that I can get from them what it is that we're trying to get together. And let me develop some, some um, movements so that they, and some signals so they know what it is that I want at any given moment. Some of those things are pretty standardized. If somebody picks up a baton and says, hey, here we go, and they give you an upbeat and they give you a downbeat. You know, if you're a wind player or you're a vocalist, you know that during that upbeat, you're gonna breathe, right? You're gonna take a breath and then you're gonna be into play, right? And if it's in this kind of a manner, I'll back up a little bit so you can see me. You know, if it's in sort of a fluid manner, you're looking for something that's probably very legato, very smooth and connected, right? But if the conductor's giving you something like this, you know, they want something that's more staccato in nature. So that, that would be just, Bill, just sort of a, an example of <clears throat> what it is a conductor's doing from, uh, from, strictly from a technical perspective and from just sort of uh, giving signals and cues so that the ensemble knows what it is that you want from them. Great. So, uh, Ryan, you just uh, used the word staccato. For anybody who's listening who happens to be perhaps a non-musician, would you describe the difference between the staccato and the fluid, the legato? Sure. So, so legato is fluid. In, in music, we, we say it's smooth and connected. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, maybe an example of that would be just grabbing a horn would be... <laughs> You know, you just play very, very lyrically or, uh, that would be very legato. Staccato would be, that would all be very staccato, right? Okay. So, uh, that was the opening of the toy soldier, uh, band from uh, Disneyland from those college years. But, um, yeah, so, so that the, so staccato, you know, uh, some people would say that's called short, you know, you want to play those notes short. In college, they'll say that's detached. Um, but it's the same thing. Yeah. Same idea. Awesome. And then uh, when you started, you uh, picked up a baton, which got me to wondering, as a conductor, what, what do you look for in a baton? Do you have a favorite baton? Or like, uh, like other players, do you have a particular baton that works better for this type of music and another one that's better for another type of music? 
Yeah, I think that's one of those, I think it's one of those things you can overthink. Now, somebody who, you know, their whole life is conducting and maybe your Dudamel or somebody like that, they're going to, they're going to have very specialized instruments. I, I like the, the Mahler uh, batons. And one of the things Larry Curtis taught me in my years in doing my undergrad work is you want to find a baton that you can balance on your finger. You want to find a balance point pretty close to the end of the baton. Because again, the grip of the baton is very important too. You want to wrap your fingers around it and be able to uh, you know, use that. And, and again, you don't, it's like having an instrument. You don't want anything to get in the way of what it is that you're trying to do. So you're looking for a baton that's well balanced and that you can hold well and communicate with. So it's almost like an extension of your arm. Like you say, you don't want it to be an obstruction, but it is a, like the tip of the baton is a focal point for the band, for the choir to watch as far as where your beat is, where your downbeat is, subsequent beats, right? Absolutely, yeah, because you want, you want that, that ictus or where the baton changes direction to be able to move and, and be able to be seen so that they can see, okay, it's, it's stopping. And again, I'm going to try to get this on camera for you. You, you want it to be able to stop at a point in time so that the, they can you know sense tempo they know style from you how you want it style wise etc cetera, etc cetera. okay okay and i imagine a, a, a lot of that is almost pre-communicated when you're getting ready to give your downbeats right if you yes you, yeah in, in your preparatory beat what you're trying to do is already detect style so and already you know, communicate that to them so if you're giving you know you're communicating tempo and style and things like that in your prep so Right. And your body language, you might mirror what you're doing with your right hand by mirroring with your left hand, depending on the size of the ensemble or if you're conducting a marching band or something like that. Cool. So what I just saw you do, if I were sitting in your orchestra, said you're going to play staccato. That looked to me as though you were getting very. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yep. Nobody's able to get in. Just, just for giggles, uh, give us an example of a nice legato. Uh, sure. So legato would be more like this. And again, you're trying to make every note full value, smooth and connected in, in what they call a singing style, cantabile, right? Awesome, man. I can, you know what? I could hear a string section in my head. And you <laughs> nice, nice. Well, you could, you could arrange for it, so it's perfect. <laughs> I'll arrange it. You conduct it. I'm um, in. You know, in our uh, museum in Gallery One, we have a great mural uh, inside our sort of faux gazebo, which mm. we're all familiar with from uh, marching bands. Uh, mm bands in the park and so forth. Uh, there's a great mural of a marching band. And then there's an oil painting of John Philip Sousa. Mm. And he's in that sort of preparatory position, right? Mm. On one hand, getting ready to give his downbeat. Okay. So John Philip Sousa, I'm sure there's plenty of other conductors. What initially got you in, interested in conducting? Was it a gentleman like Mr. Sousa? Mm. Mm. Frank Cooler? Yeah. Was it other people you'd seen? Yeah, so my, my fuse got lit on vocal and instrumental music, music in general, <clears throat> at a pretty young age. I was singing before I ever played. I played piano for a time, and then my dad was a career military guy, so we moved a lot, and I changed teachers, and then I wasn't able to continue with piano. But by the time I got to middle school, I was already singing, and <clears throat> I saw my middle school band uh, performing and uh, walking around the track just doing marching. And uh, I heard, heard the trumpet and I went, you know what, that's me. So I chose the trumpet, began in eighth grade, which is really late, <clears throat> but um, I was highly motivated. So I got a private teacher right off the bat and was able to work my way up through that section and become first chair within, within the, the school year because I, I just, I loved it. And <clears throat> I think my dad was overseas at the time. And uh, in, you know, instead of playing ball with my dad because he wasn't there, I just played the trumpet. Uh, probably to everybody's chagrin in my house, uh, big Irish Catholic family, there were seven of us. I probably drove a bunch of people out like St. Patrick drove, drove the snakes out. But um, all of that to say, um, by the time I got to high school, I, I had some just phenomenal teachers. To this extent, my high school band director, it was only a three year, three year high school at the time, my high school band director was only there for two of my three years because he took a university level job at, at San Diego State University. And as he left, and these guys just lit my fuse and I became a student conductor for the band and the choir, but they lit my fuse and to the extent that, that Harold Warman, who was my high school band director, said, hey, I've accepted this job. I'm not gonna be able to conduct the band at the high school graduation. I've already cleared it with the principal. Would you take the baton and lead the band? Wow. You know, so at age 16, I, I just said, you know what? This is too much fun wow. to not do it. And I need to pay back. These men and women have invested in me and I need to continue that and, and pay it back. And it's not a great reason to get into teaching. Uh, it sounds very altruistic, 
Um, and I actually had educators um, at the university level say, that's not a reason to be a teacher. But for me, it was reason enough. And it served me, it has served me very, very well. And it's a great way to make a, make, not only make a living, but invest in people. Uh, because the truth is like so many things you do in life, you get so much more back uh, than you can ever put in to a child. They give you so much. So true. And, and when you started to talk about this part of your journey, you said uh, you heard trumpet playing out in the field, I think you said, and boom, it spoke to you right away. Yeah. That's something we talk about at the museum quite often. Um, people will ask me, gee, what instruments should my child play? And I'll always recommend starting out with the piano lessons. I think that will hold true forever. Mm -hmm. But I basically tell them eventually your child will, uh, the instrument will speak to them, just like the trumpet spoke to you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very fortunate uh, to work with a staff who not only are amazing at what they do for the museum, but everybody's a musician. Uh, Carolyn, our director, cello is the instrument that found her. Uh, Jillian, uh, plays piano, great pianist. Uh, DJ, we, we were talking to earlier, is a tremendous drummer. Matter of fact, he's a, a hard working drummer. Uh, he, work, he works all day at the museum, then out playing drums at night. Uh, Jonathan, our artifacts manager, is a uh, tubist and a jug jugist. BJ, you're going to have to correct me on that one, but he gave our first yeah. session on Monday. Uh, Dave Liggett plays guitar. Uh, who am I forget? Allison. Loudest conductor, uh, and then we have the meanest egg player in the world, Lisa Myers. BJ, I believe the correct, uh, if I've learned anything from Monday, I think the correct term is jug blower. Jug blower. Thank jug you. Blower. All right. <laughs> I sit corrected. <laughs> um, was there a question, uh, BJ, in the chat room there? Uh, yes, we've got a couple from uh, our uh, viewers, especially. Well, Carolyn's on the on the on the, the live stream too, and uh, she has a couple questions she wanted to ask. How do you learn to be a conductor? And this is a two part. You can answer these separately. What was it like uh, to uh, conduct your first professional engagement? What was that experience like? Well, I think the best way to learn is uh, and learn to be a great conductor is be under the baton of great conductors. And uh, Bill and I were fortunate to do that at the university level. Uh, I was fortunate even before that, as I said, to sit under Harold Warman and others who were just fantastic. And so what you do is like so much of what you do in your life is you emulate, you go, okay, that's being done very well. Uh, that's something I wanna to try to do at that level. And one of the highest compliments I've ever received as a conductor on a consistent basis is I'm clear in my conducting. Well, I learned that. I learned that from great teachers. So <clears throat> for me, it's really all about sitting under great conductors, which you can spend your whole life doing. And I, and I recommend doing it. I've recently, you know, re-engaged in some playing and sat under some conductors and, and some of which I go, wow, I, you know, that's not clear to me. Is there a way that you can make that a little clearer? Uh, which is not, you know, popular, uh, but it, it's one of those things you go, you know, I want to be able to put the notes where you want them. And I want to do it in a way that is honoring to the music, but I, I just need a little more clarity. Uh, and your first uh, professional conducting gig, I think that was the second half. Yeah, I think it was for me, it was I was 16 and I got handed the baton to conduct the high school band. Uh, for me, it, it was that moment that just said, OK, you're the dude. And if this thing falls apart, it falls apart under your baton. And I was like, that's not going to happen, man. That's that's not how I roll. <laughs> Very good. Uh, we've mentioned Frank Fuller a few times in here. I think we should touch uh, on his influence Okay. Uh, both of us uh, a little more here. Uh, my experience with Frank was, um, and this is so classic Frank Fuller, said, so Frank, I'm interested in conducting maybe choirs. How do I do what you do? And he handed me a book and he said, read this. Mm. That, was my, that was my lesson with Frank. Mm. But how about you? I know he probably uh, brought you up to conduct the choir, gave you the baton here and there. Yeah, I, again, I, I, I stumbled into Frank's choir. I went to Long Beach State for the instrumental music program. I'd, I'd, my, again, my high school band director is good friends with Larry G. Curtis, who was the instrumental conductor at Long Beach State, both for marching band and other high level ensembles. So I was sold on Larry Curtis because we used to literally pile in the high school band director's car and drive to Long Beach and watch those, those uh, rehearsals. Um, so I went there for that reason. Plus my sister had, my older sister had attended there and several uh, high school roommates had gone to Long Beach State. And again, we were very close to San Diego area having grown up in Vista, California, but I was sold on Long Beach. So I went there for the instrumental program. But when I got there at 17, 
uh, I discovered Frank's choir. And uh, of course, I'd already I'd done instrumental and vocal all the way through high school. And so when I heard about Frank's group, I said, well, I have to audition. Well, I wasn't prepared and I auditioned at 17 and bombed. Uh, it wasn't the first audition I'd ever bombed, but I determined that I was going to get involved with Frank and his choir. So I went to him and I said, hey, Frank, uh, Mr. Pooler, uh, what, uh, what would I need to do uh, to be a serious candidate for consideration into your choir for next year? He said, wait, go take some summer vocal study and I'll see you next year. But tell me a little bit more about you. And that was typical Frank. And so he learned that I was a trumpet player and I'd done some conducting and said, great, I'm, I'm looking forward to having you audition in the fall. And so I went and studied and I made the choir the following year and I spent five years under Frank's baton and I don't regret a single day of it. Uh, I learned every day. I, I got challenged every day vocally and in other ways. And at some point I'd said to him, you know, I'd like to become one of your student conductors. And uh, he gave me the nod and gave me a try. And uh, he, Frank was always great about doing postmortem too. He'd, he'd meet with you afterwards and say, hey, here's what I think went well. Here's what I think you could have done better. And so you got good feedback from him so that you could learn and, and grow and be better the next day. Right. Yeah. And we were talking about this earlier. Uh, one of the one of the best qualities of, of that uh, gentleman was seeing, as you were as you were saying earlier, seeing potential in his students and encouraging it oh, rather man. than saying, well, I'm the conductor, you're the student, do what I tell you to do. No, he would yeah. not only you, but several student conductors he would bring up during the course of the choir year. Uh, yeah. If you found out you played an instrument, as you know, I dragged what three guitars around Australia when we yeah, were right. there back in right. the yep. So be careful what you wish for. But seriously, he, I think encouraged myself, yourself, and so many others mm. to follow their path. Uh, yours being education and conducting. So let's get back to uh, conducting. <clears throat> Question that occurred to me is when you're up there in front of your band, you've got the instrument sections. You've got brass. You've got uh, percussion, you've got woodwinds. Mm -hmm. As a conductor, do you look at each section and approach them differently with what you do, what you give them conducting? No, not in terms of what I want to get extract from them or partner together with them. I don't. My conducting uh, would be the same across the board for all sections. Uh, but again, I'm looking for them to look at me so we can stay together so that we're getting, um, you know, if it's something that's very rubato and the tempo is moving, you know, back and forth and ebbing and flowing, you know, obviously somebody with a baton has to be leading that mm -hmm. so that we can move together. Right. And right. I, and again, some of the, the most beautiful moments with some of my ensembles are such that we've prepared so well that then I can just put the baton down and I can walk around the room and just listen, or I can walk around the hall if we're doing a sound check and just listen. Um, and of course, with jazz ensembles, that's all you do. You know, nobody worth their salt really conducts a jazz band, in, in my opinion. Uh, it, you start it. You, you give some cues if there's some tempo changes, sure. You insert yourself. If you want to let you count down some solos so that somebody's got four measures left before the other guy takes over, that's fine. But <clears throat> those are the things, those are the moments where you go, wow, we are hitting on all cylinders. If that ensemble can fly without me, I've done my job really well because now they're, they're recreating the music in the way that the composer intended and in such a way that's really honoring uh, of the music. Beautiful. It looks like BJ has a question. Yeah, look, that kind of answers one of the questions we had in the uh, the, the live area. There is uh, I, one Brian asked, "Can a well-trained orchestra slash band perform without a conductor or a director?" And it sounds like you've answered that. Once they're prepared, and uh, you know, once you give them the, the kind of the knowledge that they need to impart on their performance, that they can operate um, on their own out in the wild, uh, okay. and then also. Um, uh, there's another question why don't quartets have a conductor uh, and i've got a flurry of questions here this is a great question so our, our director again asked like why don't, why don't quartets have a conductor and one from Catherine is like can you share any information about someone who is conducting from an instrument like say a piano like who needs to conduct another group out of that so i'll let you feel those all right, let me whack away at those a little bit. Um, your, you know, the quartet or small ensemble, um, sort of chamber music. Again, you're logging the kinds of hours and time with those various members that, you know, if I burp, then the guy next to me is going to feel better. That's how tight we are, and that's how close we are, and that's how well enmeshed we are. So uh, usually, you know, you'll get somebody in a quartet that'll be like, you know, again, if I'm sitting in a quartet and we're getting ready to start, it's like. 
you know, you give a little head nod to get things started. But from there, you know, you should be locked and loaded to do what you need to do, um, you know, to make that thing fly. Uh, what was the second question? Uh, the other question was, uh, uh, why don't quartets have a conductor? And then uh, can I, uh, I'm trying to watch me read. Can you share information about conducting from the piano? Oh, yeah. Uh, so there you go. And, and Bill, Bill, that you, you could answer that question probably better than I, because you're a much better piano player than I am. And you've done that. <laughs> yes, I have. Uh, and, you know, Ryan and everybody, it's it's much the same as how you were describing a, a quartet moving. Uh, the pianist, obviously, if it's piano conductor, they will either count the tune down, ask the drummer to count the tune down, or they'll just give a head nod. And an ensemble, as you say, that has worked together <clears throat> intently and uh, for as long as, as they have, they really do become like one cohesive unit. Uh, I'm gonna bring uh, to light another player that you and I both know and have worked with uh, for many, many years, keyboardist Don French. Mm. Don French and I still play gigs together once in a while. We have played together, I'm just gonna throw it out there for 40 years. And honest to goodness, while we're playing little grooves, little songs, we'll, we'll blow, both play the same riff at the same time. Mm. That's how cohesive our yeah. thinking is together or I'll play a riff and he's getting ready to do one and it just mm. sort of dovetails off of mine. Mm. So mm. I think that's what happens in the piano conductor world yeah. and in the quartet world. Yeah, I totally agree. Absolutely agree. Yeah. You get to the point where just you're, you're, you're almost thinking the same th thoughts and you're just, it's kind of a mind meld, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You are one unit. So, okay. Each section you say you aren't really thinking differently. What about different ensembles? Like, is your conducting for a choir different than for a concert band, different for a marching band? Absolutely. Absolutely. That. Yeah. So just from just from sort of a pragmatic perspective, you're conducting a marching band. First of all, many guys wear many men and women wear gloves just to be seen. You're going to mirror your conducting in a marching band, and you're going to be big in a marching band. You're, in other words, your pattern is going to be quite large. You know, this is you. You're going to look like you're landing a 747. I mean, you're just because you've got a huge group, and they're spread out over, you know, 50, 70, 100 yards, right? So that's the first thing. Um, you've got to be very animated and very big. The subtleties in, in a big ensemble and a large ensemble, I, I once conducted in the 80s, I did a 500 voice choir in Arkansas. It, that's, that's a different conducting technique, a much larger conducting technique than me conducting a small vocal ensemble. Um, at Viewpoint, uh, when I was at Viewpoint School for almost a decade, we, I started a uh, vocal jazz ensemble. Bonnie Grave at Royal High School said, this is what you want to do. You don't want to do schmo choir, you want to do. So I started a, 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 a jazz group. And again, uh, when, when you're initially teaching parts and things like that, there'll be some conducting. But again, in a vocal jazz group, you're like, all right, here we go, one, two, oh, two. And you kick them off and you get out of the way. Um, and same with, with uh, instrumental uh, jazz, as I mentioned earlier, um, versus, versus some of the techniques for an orchestra. I conducted a 40-piece orchestra for several summers with the Continentals. And uh, yeah, that's a very different kind of a look than you might even take with a concert band. It might be somewhat different because, again, you want to make sure that everybody's starting at the same time. You want to make sure you know, that all your, all your strings are at the frog and they're ready to go. And yeah, it's, 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 it varies with the, with the type of ensemble and the size of ensemble. Okay. Now, let me take that a little step further, because I have uh, actually worked with you in some of the musicals that you've conducted. And to me, that seems like sort of you're on both sides of the fence when you are conducting a musical. And by that, I mean, yes, you are conducting the orchestra, the band, whatever the ensemble is, but you are also a follower because you are watching the singers in the musical and you were trying to honor their tempos, their, their needs. Mm -hmm. How do you balance that being on both sides of the fence? So that, that's a little bit of a tricky one in that uh, you still want to lead, right? But you do need to follow. But then there's that thing that says, okay, well, you know, they're the students and, and you're trying to keep everybody together. So you got to make sure that you're, again, staying true to the music and nobody's sort of painting too far outside the lines. But yeah, <laughs> you, right. Uh, taking too many musical liberties, in other words. But again, if, if some kid goes, 
you got to be ready with that. And musicals are infamous for this, right? Where some kid, you know, he's jumped an entire verse or he's down at the end of the song or he's singing the reprise and you're not. And then you're like, okay, we're at 53. Here we go. Right. And you just let everybody know, but it's absolutely that, right. It's absolutely that balance of, yeah, I'm trying to keep the ensemble together, but these guys are here to back those guys. And at the end of the day, people are coming to hear and see those people on the stage. Not me. It's not about me. So you're a bit like the captain of the Titanic in a moment, like <laughs> totally. Yeah, and you're arranging deck chairs, and like, why, right? I, I can attest to that. I, I you know, I'm playing with a, a a rock and roll cover band. There's times when people are like, "Oh, hey, can I sing with your band?" Oh, sure. Come on up. And they uh, don't always know all of all the verses, or don't always, so as a as a musician in that circumstance. Oh, here now we're at part B, or we're, we're going to do the chorus a third time. It's, I, I get it. I get it. Oh, we had a couple more uh, questions. Speaking of, uh, in fact, the singers and choral groups, uh, this is a little bit off topic, but I think it's a really good uh, question. Can you explain kind of the solfege idea behind choral groups, if you have any input on that? I know that it's like the, uh, you know, the, the sound of music type of uh, mm -hmm. interpretation of that, uh, but we had somebody who was curious about that. And then also another question, um, these are two separate ideas, but uh, does it require an above average critical ear to be a successful conductor? Well, I'll I think I'll take the second one first. Yes. Uh, and I do my best listening when I'm not conducting. So uh, sometimes when I get my arm going and I'm thinking about the music itself and I'm trying to listen, it's a little bit of sensory overload for me. So if I stop conducting and let my ensemble players sing, then I can listen better. So I'm going to say that right off the bat. Um, the other question was about solfege. Um, a big believer. Uh, first of all, let's get something out of the way. Uh, singers and instrumentalists are all musicians. All right. So just so that we're all using good terminology because um, we all need to work on our craft, whether it's conducting, playing, singing, all those things. Everybody's a student of what they do every day. Right. So um, in, in, as vocalists, uh, one of the things we need to work on uh, is successful sight reading because it's not easy i can i can i can do a better job on that piece of brass at sight reading than i can vocally because i practice that more um so i think soulfish is a great method whether it's fixed dough or movable dough i think sight singing and working on sight reading uh is great no matter what your instrument and no matter where you are in your journey with music right i would uh add to that it's you get your sight rating chops together you have done so much of the groundwork for the conductor would you agree with that assessment Ryan? oh absolutely absolutely because the the last thing you want is to be in the way and, and inhibiting the process so you know it so like i'll say to my students you know if you'll go do uh, you know this individual work when we come back together you know the rehearsal is rehearing that's where that word comes from right rehearsal so you want to be able to rehear things in the way that it's intended to do so you got to go do that work so you're not in the way and that way you just get the baton and you go, the parts, they're not stumbling through the parts in other words. Right. So for you to have to be spending your conducting time teaching individual notes is counterproductive, I think, to your, to your role as conductor. When Absolutely. all those pieces of the pie are ready to be put together, you're the one that puts it in the oven and bakes it and makes it. Exactly. Yeah. Then, then you're just the master mixer and you get to, you get to really, because the music's made in between all of that stuff, right? Like that's what's there. Here's what we're doing. But man, as the conductor, you're just trying to make that whole thing come together so well that you, it's just this beautiful moment. Yeah. Yeah. So have you ever uh, had any sort of deer in the headlight moments? You maybe give a downbeat and nothing happens, or you cut off the orchestra, but they keep going. Uh, what are what are some of the kind of fun oh, little yeah. moments that you've experienced? Oh gosh, yeah, I've <laughs> I've had them. I've had them as a player. I've had them as a conductor. So um, some of my Long Beach State colleagues will remember something called the Copa Show, which you know Long Beach State in those days had a big marching band and, and a football team that was just kind of there for decoration. And like if we could have changed uh, traded our marching band for the USC football team, we'd have like a winning combo. Just for the record, Your Honor. So we're we're at Anaheim Stadium, and uh, we and one of the I think it was Marvin Branson, another great conductor and a fantastic arranger and a quintessential musician, gave a downbeat for what became known as the Copa Show because it was the '70s and we we're doing Copacabana. 
And, you know, the, the Tom Tom player, God bless him, um, uh, still wears this, you know, shame. Uh, he gave a downbeat and the kid came in on three. So your marching man starts, steps off on beat one, right? And everybody else is in, he comes in on three. It's like, don't, 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 don't. So the whole thing just went into the crapper right there. Um, so yes, there was, there was that moment. And uh, we all got a pretty good tongue lashing at, at the end of that. And, and it was one kid's fault, um, which you know, oftentimes it is. Um, so from a player's perspective, there was certainly that moment that's indelibly uh, written on my brain and, and many others. Um, and I've had, I've had them too as, 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 a, um, as a conductor. Um, but I, I don't know that I can ever remember a time where I've had to start a song over in a concert. Again, so, so much of life is about preparation. And Bill, you're, you're brilliant at this. You don't ever try something publicly that you haven't just refined. Um, almost to the point where you're almost sick of the music. You have to you creep up on that edge as a conductor. Like, I still want my ensemble excited about playing this music. But one of the things, you know, going back to Frank Pooler. Frank was brilliant at was reminding us all that the audience is here for the first time. I don't care where you are and what you're doing it. Give them the impression of the first time and having that magic. He would say, uh, keep a, keep a warm heart, but a cool head. And, and when you're trying to deliver music, whether it's with one of these, one of those or vocally, that's what you want to do. There you go. All right, well, since we're telling stories, I have to tell this one because it's speaking of indelible. <clears throat> one of the uh, ensembles that you and I played in back in uh, our college days is called Voce, which is a Latin for- Voice, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it was a fun little pop uh, vocal group, uh, mm -hmm. led by our dear friend, Bob Olson. Mm -hmm. And Bob had this wonderful idea. He said to all the people in the group who were singers, hey, why don't you come up with a song that's one of your favorites. I'm going to put together a medley and we'll do this as sort of the, I think it was the, the finale of this show we were doing. Yeah, that's right. So you chose? A uh, good hearted woman. Good. Waylon heart. Jennings. And Waylon Jennings. And so we're cooking away and we're playing. I believe you even had the whole garden. You had the cowboy hat and you're ready to go, right? Sounds like me. Yeah. Brian starts walking down the runway and Bob <clears throat> gave us some sort of a signal that was not what he intended, but apparently the entire band thought it meant go to the coda, we're wrapping this up. So you got all the way down the runway, you're ready to go into the song, and you heard us go, ba -da -ba -ba -da -da -da. so you turned right around and did this country walk back, like that's the way we planned it, folks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've because it's about a, that for 40 years. I want oh, yeah. another chance to play that song. <laughs> yeah, well, dude, anytime you want to play, sing, or conduct, I'm in. And anytime I get to hang out with you and do stuff with you musically, I'm in. Right. Um, but yeah, that's and and so that's where, you know, when you're taught well to be a performer, as you and I were, uh, you just you roll with it and there's right. never a mistake, right? You just roll with it and you and you do your best to recover. <laughs> Keep smiling. Absolutely. It's like another question coming in. Uh, one from uh, Marlene, one of our volunteers at the Museum of Making. Yeah, Marlene. She asks, uh, are there uh, more women enter women conductors entering the profession? Do you have any quick stats on that or quick impressions? I don't have any stats, uh, but there are some phenomenal uh, female conductors. And there seem to be more and more entering all the time, which I think is beautiful. Uh, it's a it's a great thing. And uh, and. I, I think it's much more prevalent than when in the years that I was growing up. Yeah, I think uh, several of our uh, university choir colleagues, females, went on to be uh, wonderful conductors. And again, kudos to Frank Cooler yeah. for his encouragement. Yeah. Any other uh, questions, BJ? I think that's great. I mean, are there any parting thoughts that we wish to throw out there to the world? Sure. Oh, Bill's got his whole... Did. Are we, are we, we're, are we through it? I'm not following along with your script. I'm just rolling with it. I'm, I'm, I love the stories. I love learning about your experiences as a conductor. Um, you know, I, I, I don't have any questions myself, but I'll let you guys keep rolling for as long as you want to. We're, we're only at, we're 30 minutes right now. So this is uh, you know, a wonderful moment to share what you want to share about conducting and music making in general. Sure. Ryan, any, uh, you want to take off on that? Well, you know, I got I got all kinds of stories and some of them are true. Um, but, you know, music's been such a gift to me and I'm, I'm so thankful to be involved in it still. 
at, at 59. And, you know, I, I want to stay involved in it all my life in, in performing and, and uh, I don't compose, I don't arrange, uh, I haven't, I haven't tapped into that yet. Uh, but I, I love it. And, you know, I just, I love the leadership that Bill and I had with Frank Pooler. Frank was one of these leaders, uh, BJ and Bill, that Bill knows as well, that he wasn't ever threatened by anybody. There were, there were people coming in all the time that were better at him, better than, better than him at certain things. And he, he sort of took the Dale Carnegie approach. Like, you know, I'd much rather have 1% of hundred people's efforts than hundred percent of my own. He was no slouch. He was a tenor sax player. He was a vocalist. He was a conductor, but he always just looked for the best in people and he wanted to fan everybody's flame because he just realized, look, I'm going to get so much more out of this if I do it and I'm not threatened by it. And boy, I don't meet many people that are wired up that way. Most people are just really threatened by the fact that somebody might be better at me than stuff. Man, I, I think I just pulled that from Frank. I just kind of went, you know what? I, I'm not going to, I'm just going to choose to, to live my life that way because I'm going to get so much more out of it and people are going to get a chance to learn and grow so much better as a result of it. So yeah, I think uh, I think uh, as a musician, it's a good thing to know that there are people who are better than you, because that gives you an opportunity to to further yourself. Absolutely. I mean, if, if I'm you're looking around and I, I don't see anybody else on the playing field, then you know how am I improving? Yeah, no, I so agree. I mean, I, I, at 17, I walked into a marching band again, you know, not, not sort of the quintessential musical experience necessarily, but Long Beach State did it really well. We had great leadership, but I walked in, there were 50 trumpet players and, you know, I was top dog at my high school, but, you know, maybe there were a dozen or 15 of us and, but you know what? I learned a ton and, and Bill, I would say our experience with, with university choir, with Frank and with Voce, with Bob Olson and others. You know, look at some of the people that were in the rooms that we were in. We had Sal Lozano at Voce at one time. You know, he's a major session player today. Uh, you know, and I could just go on. Kevin Klein, you know, <laughs> Paul Furt Camp, and, and Leo Valenzuela. You know, you mentioned uh, uh, Don French. I mean, there were just the, some of these people that we were in the room with. Uh, John Patitucci was at Long Beach in some of those same years. Just rock star, mm -hmm. uh, grade A prime killer players. How about uh, some of the killer musicians, players who were there before you and I, Ryan? We were talking about some of those this morning. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, again, uh, so many of those people came through Frank Pooler's choir, like Larry Carlton, uh, Tom and John Baylor, Karen and Richard Carpenter, who preceded us by about 10 years. You know, Frank was, as we were talking about earlier with BJ, Frank was, was, was the, the guy in the music department and probably at the whole university that was advocating for Karen and Richard, he, he stepped in and said, you know, cut these kids some slack. They're going to school here, but they're trying to make something of themselves. They're trying to break into this pop music industry. And, you know, if they miss a class, you know, so be it, you know, there's bigger things and God bless him. You know, because I think a lot of the reason that Richard in particular kept the affinity with the choir that he did was because of Frank uh, and the reason he wanted the choir to sing at Karen's funeral and perform a tribute concert. Uh, they did a Christmas concert the year before I got in the choir, doggone it. Um, but, you know, there was j just because it was relational and music is so relational. You know, you guys have you know, indicated that this morning with, with all these great people that you work with, but you make music together. And, you know, that's what it's about. It's about the hang. I mean, how many of us know great players and great, you know, great singers that don't get the call because they're just not fun to be around. Uh, they're, they're sort of radioactive. They were present during Chernobyl. And so you go, you know, if I have my choice, I'm gonna hire this guy or this gal because they're a great player, great singer, and they're fun to be around. And they're, they're challenging me about my own life and how to be better at my craft. Yep, that's a good, that's a good pro tip. Be good, be nice, and you know, you're, you're bound to have a good network with you. I concur. Let me, um, yeah, BJ, any other questions before I say a couple more times? I'm good. If you guys want to, yeah, I think we did a great job today. I think uh, well, we learned a lot. And, I mean, it, any passing thoughts, Mr. Bill? Yeah, I don't want to let it go just yet because we okay. talked so much about uh, Frank Pooler's influence on Ryan, you, myself, so many other people. How about you, Ryan? I know you've been conducting in the high school world for 20 years, maybe? 20? Yeah, uh, yeah. let's see, uh, 20, 24, uh, let's see, plus three, 27, 27 total. I, your influence on your students has got to be mirroring Frank's influence on us. 
Absolutely. What have you seen as far as your students and the passion that they've developed for conducting, singing, playing, mm. pursuing a life of music, be it an avocation, mm. vocation, or an actual professional career? What, what yeah, I, as certainly in, in the years that, that I've been involved, I've had students go on and be, continue to be involved in music, whether it's just, you know, at, with an acoustic guitar and a glass of wine at six o'clock after banking for a day, uh, uh, or, uh, you know, in a more professional way. Uh, we've had kids, I, I, one of my students at, at Oaks uh, went on and played with a one o'clock band at North Texas State, uh, or I think it's University of North Texas now, um, and with, with uh, Wayne Bergeron as a soloist. And I had a kid like that, he was a drummer, and I had a kid at Viewpoint by the name of Anne-Marie Boscovich, I think she goes by Annie Bosco. These kids, these students who are, you know, the, who are now adults and thriving, when you see talent of that nature, the best thing to do is stay out of their way. Guide them a little bit, give them some tips, but try to stay out of the way. What I see too many conductors do, it's too many educators do, is they get they they try to micromanage. And when you do that, you end up mucking stuff up. Just give give them give them some guidelines, throw some margins in them, some tips, and stay out of the way. And Frank was brilliant at that. I I'm, I'm sure that we learned that from him. Yep. Amen. Well, Ryan, this has been tremendous, and uh, I cannot thank you enough for saying, yes, I'd love to be a part of this. Uh, BJ <clears throat> came up with this mom at home idea through a webinar he attended, and I think those of us on the staff of the museum all agree that we'd like to keep this going in, in some fashion or another once uh, life returns to normal. And uh, you have uh, been part of our inaugural week uh, and really help make it uh, something special. And I think it'd just be wonderful if you played us out with, I don't know, Happy Trails or something like that. On well, that. yeah, I don't, I, you know, I'll do what I can. This thing's, this thing's pretty cold now, though. Uh, how about this? on I'm, I'm not sure but whoever wrote it did a great job yes. songwriters man wow yeah to be a great songwriter there's a whole nother session love yeah. you guys thank you for including me thanks for being here thanks My so pleasure. much we'll see you next time we've got one more of our mom at home series scheduled for tomorrow with a luthier and a volunteer at the museum of making music and he's going to share all about uh his experiences building guitars woods tools everything that goes into that so it should be fun i think we're hosting that at 10 a.m right bill that is correct 10 a.m on friday the 27th so join us then we'll see you guys later thanks ryan thanks bill I'm Ryan. yeah man thank you great job thanks bj, BJ thank you <laughs> Woohoo!